As has been said, my name is Daniel Stevens, and I'm grateful to be here, grateful to Dr. Moeller and the President's Office for inviting me, and uh, to Dr. Bruce for that very kind introduction. One of the great privileges of teaching here is I get to open the Bible and talk about Jesus, and I'm glad for the opportunity to do that with all of you today. So please let's pray and then get started. Dear Lord, you are good to us beyond measure. You are kind, you are loving, you are holy, and in your holiness, you come to us and make us holy. We pray that you would be here as your word is preached, that you would work in it, that it would be as it is living and active among us, and that you would cause us to cling all the more dearly to Christ, that we would walk in greater faith and love. Bless me as I speak. Bless us all as we hear your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Now, you don't know how grateful you should be that I said that and spared you my singing voice, but I assure you, I've done you a kindness. Nearly every day for the past three and a half years, between once and dozens of times a day, I have sung those words to my children. So much so at night that with our oldest, I feared that he would start to associate it so strongly with bedtime that if he heard it during the day, he would start to fight. And I sing it to them, not only because it has a melody simple enough that I can mostly carry it, but because I want them to have the truth of this simple song in their bones. I want their memories of their childhood and their very sense of themselves to be shaded by this reality, that Jesus loves me, Jesus loves them. And I'm at particular pains for them to know that, to know God's love as surely as they know themselves, because I've had such a hard time believing it in my own life. From the first time I became a Christian, I've had very few doubts regarding the intellectual propositions of Christianity. The doctrines and worldview of Christianity have always been broadly persuasive to me. But the personal proposition that God actually loves me, that he cares for me, this I have found difficult. And I imagine that many of you in this room sometimes feel the same. All Christians at times go through seasons where God's love feels distant. And often the challenge of the Christian life isn't knowing what's right or mustering the willpower for the next step, but it's having faith in God's provision and love for you. And even this can face us in many ways. Sometimes knowledge of our sin, it fills our minds and our conscience, and we are certain that God at best merely tolerates us. Other times, the weight of the demands of the Christian life bears down on us, and we see in God only a stern and a distant ruler. We allow ourselves to be too much burdened by the weight of past sins or the demands of future righteousness, and our own strength cannot bear it. But this is not how the Christian life should be. There is another way. And in Paul's letter to the Galatians, he writes to those who are tempted to live the Christian life by the flesh, that is by mere human strength. And he directs their eyes instead to the full work of Christ through the Spirit for them and for all who believe. And while the situation he addresses is different from our own in the details, what he says through this epistle, and especially what he says in our passage for today, Galatians chapter 2, verses 19 and 20, speaks as much to our own failings and our own needs as it did to them. So please look down with me to Galatians 2, 19 to 20, and let us see what he has to say. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me 
and gave himself for me. This passage begins with a four. It provides the basis for something else. And the Galatians had a problem. False teachers had entered the Galatian churches and were teaching those Gentiles that to properly be Christian, to really be on the inside of God's people and to really have standing in favor before God, they needed to submit to the Mosaic law. And when Paul heard of this, he recognized that it was not merely the danger of making the Christian life harder to live, but rather that it was entirely opposed to the true gospel of Christ. Having begun by God's gift in the spirit, they were now thinking of continuing by the strength of the flesh. Their past lives as Gentiles apart from Christ were being used to make them feel estranged from God all over again. And the heavy burden of keeping the law was held up in front of them as the only way of really being a Christian, of being ultimately accepted before God. They were overwhelmed, they were bewitched, and they were in danger of falling away from Christ. And in this letter, Paul's solution to them, his call and his comfort in the face of their past lives of sin and these new demands of the law was to show them again all that Christ has already done and does for them. Paul's word to the Galatians is that the key to the Christian life, the way to be free of the guilt of sin and to walk freely in righteousness is not more of you, but Christ. And Paul's word to you in this passage, whether you are weighed down by a consciousness of your own sins or by the demands of the future is the same, not more of you, but Christ. The point of this passage in this sermon is this, live Christ's life in you. That is, live the Christian life by faith. And he reaches this point by narrating a surprising story, a story not of one life which improves through moral effort, but a story of the multiple lives of the Christian. The gospel announces the death and the resurrection of Christ, and in that proclamation we find our own death and our own life. And as we look into this passage and hear Paul move us to a faith-filled, love-motivated freedom, we will follow his biography of the lives of every Christian, which will also serve us as our outline for this morning. So first, the life that died. Second, the life Christ lives. And third, the life I now live. So let us consider first the life that died. Look back to the passage, Galatians 2, 19. For through the law, I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. This is Paul's surprising declaration to those who wish to establish submission to the law as the standard by which we have standing in the church and confidence before God. The law, we find, is not what gives the Christian life, but rather what we have died to as Christians. And while submission to the law in the Galatian churches was certainly presented simply as obedience to God's word, Paul rejects it as another gospel which is no gospel, and he does so fundamentally on three principles. First, to put your confidence in any of your own obedience, even your own obedience to God's law, is to live by the flesh. That is, not to live by the Spirit. It is to live by the merely human logic of doing and earning, not in the free gift of the righteousness that comes in Jesus. Second, it is to misunderstand the role of the law, which is to lead us to Christ, not to give us life itself. When we truly follow the law, we learn that it leads us where it cannot go. And third, and most related to this passage, to submit to the law for righteousness is both to reject the righteousness that comes freely in Christ and to call down the curse of the law upon yourself the moment you let a single commandment slip. Now, what does this have to do with this passage and with us? Paul is addressing how we deal with sin and righteousness in our own lives. Why did Peter and Paul first turn to Jesus? To be forgiven and made righteous. Why did the Galatians first turn to Jesus? To be forgiven and made righteous. Why was the legalizing false teaching persuasive to the Galatians? Because even after coming to Christ, they were aware of their sin and they wanted yet more to be forgiven and made righteous. In their own experience, it felt like claiming Christ didn't do it and they wanted more. And so they were led to seek accomplishment of their own. And so it is often with us. 
We are all confronted by the law and it condemns us all as sinners. And for most of us in this room, that first consciousness of sin, whether it was, as we heard last week, the guilt of sinfully spilled soup as a child or a life of broken relationships and devastation, that sense is what first brought us to Christ. But then, after that first flush of forgiveness, as your Christian life continued, the sense of guilt sneaks back in. The memory of things you did before you were a Christian comes back in flashes of guilt and shame. A persistent struggle with sin raises its head whenever you're alone and it speaks condemnation to you. It seems you will never stop giving in to lust or mistreating those around you or envying those with an easier life. And in guilt and in shame, you see this ugliness within yourself. And when you do, when you're overwhelmed by this sense of sin, where do you turn? To yourself? To stricter rules? To the thundering voice of more law? No. That way lies only failure. The law can only curse and condemn you. To turn to the law for righteousness, even to turn to it as a Christian, is to turn only to that which declares your guilt and your death. Now, do not misunderstand. Elsewhere, Paul speaks of the law of Christ or approaching the law in the new way of the Spirit. But that isn't what he's talking about here. Rather, to approach the law in the flesh, to approach the law as a thing done by us that makes us righteous, it is to invite death and death alone. But what does the Scripture say? Through the law, I died to the law. What could this mean? The law says you are guilty. You feel it in your bones. The law condemns every failed attempt at obedience. Your conscience joins in and condemns you with it. The law demands the curse of death. It demands that you die. And the gospel responds, you did die. The law had a demand, one final decree, you must die. And the gospel speaks, you did die. Christian, you have died. You have already had the penalty required of you paid. And how? Well, Paul answers that as well. I have been crucified with Christ. When Jesus died on the cross, you died. The law has nothing more to demand. How can this be? Well, to believe in Jesus is to be united to him, to be his and to be a part of him. All of your life is his and all of his life is yours. So Christian, by faith, you have been crucified with Christ. You did do wrong. You did live in sin. You became very guilty and deserve death. And even now in your flesh as a Christian, you sin and you fail. But that life is not your life. That life died. That life was nailed to the cross in the body of Jesus. It is not who you are and whoever you are now, you are not the one that the law condemned because that you, that life died when Christ died. You are dead to the law. You are crucified with Christ. And this is not merely a metaphor or an inspiring image. If you are a Christian, you are united to him by faith. You have died as surely as you sit in this room. That sinner isn't you anymore because you died. And so when the weight of past sins or the guilt of today's besetting sins weighs down on your conscience, you can respond gladly. Yes, the law demands that a person who did such sins should die. Yes, these sins are horrible affronts to God, which deserve death. But in the justice and in the grace of God, that sinner has already died. I died to the law. I have been crucified with Christ. Those sins may have been mine, but in Christ, they are not mine, and that is not me. Your sins, past and present, are no longer who you are, and the life that once lived in sin no longer lives. But then, if that life has died, who lives here now? Well, I'm so glad you asked. That brings us to our second point the life that Christ lives. Look back to the passage, Galatians 2.20. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Who lives here now? Christ does. Christian, who owns your life? Christ does. Who most truly lives the life you live? Christ does. About two years ago, my wife and I moved into our house and we realized something about the previous owners. They were 
do-it-yourselfers. But they were the kind of do-it-yourselfers who essentially only did things halfway. So they built a solar-powered watering system for the garden. But the wiring and the battery were out, exposed to the wind and the rain. They had a built-in bed frame for a guest room, but it was a suspicious structure cobbled together with leftover subflooring just sitting on the wood of the floor. The upstairs bedrooms had no doors because they treated one of the two like a walk-in closet. And when we moved in, we were left with an automated system that changed the air conditioner and heating and a light bulb in the kitchen wired to always be on that we could not change, we could only unplug. Suffice to say, the longer we live in this house, the fewer of these projects remain. Slowly, and because of my distractions, more slowly than it should be, the signs of the previous owners are disappearing from our home. Why? Because somebody else lives there now. Christian, that's how it is with you. Somebody else lives here now. You were a sinner. You were a disaster, a curse, and a wreck. But somebody new lives here now. By faith, Christ Jesus lives within you. It's his life now. And the longer he's there, the more he's going to change. Soon all of the works of the former man, the sinner who died, they're going to be gone. It is Christ's life in you to build as he sees fit, and he is going to do it. Do not, again, misunderstand me. I'm not saying that you can just sit back and be indifferent to how you live. Paul's going to get to the you part. But in the Christian life, before we do anything, Christ does it in us. The structure of this passage is the structure of the Christian life. Your life is Christ's. You do not live anymore. Christ lives in you. And this union with Christ, this new reality of Christ living in you is one of the blessings of the Christian life that can be declared, but for which my words are inadequate to describe. The Son of God, by His Spirit, lives in you. Really and truly, so much so that Paul can say, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Wherever you go, you bear Christ. He lives in you. He gives life to you. And this, this is a blessed thing that gives us truest life. And practically, it plays out with at least the following few implications. First, have faith and patience. Jesus will live his life in you. Change will come. Growth will come come. But in his time and as he pleases, sometimes he gives the quick growth of grass in the summer. At other times, he works with the slow growth of a great oak. But rest assured, have faith, he will do it. Second, receive the call to righteousness in the Christian life, not as a burden, but as a gift. Every act of obedience he calls you to, he performs in you. Augustine phrases this as a prayer, grant what you command and command what you will. Equally so in the Christian life, we can say it as a promise, he will grant what he commands. He will see to it himself as he lives his life in you. And third, in retrospect, we are never to be proud of our own obedience or compare our obedience to others. It may be the case that the Lord will use you greatly. He may grant you to perform great acts of obedience. You may bring the gospel to those who have never heard it. You may endure through the fires of persecution and opposition. You may turn the tide of sin in a culture and establish decades of faithfulness in a place that previously had abandoned God. Generations may be changed by your work for Christ. I hope they are. I hope you do it. But when you do, when you look back on your own acts of faithfulness and obedience, instead of seeing your own greatness, see rather that all of your obedience has been a gift to you. See not yourself living, but wonder at the splendor of Christ living in you. And Christian, it is truly in you that Christ lives, which brings us to our third and final point, the life you now live. Back to Galatians 
In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. For the story so far, you are freed from the guilt of sin because in Christ you have died. The penalty for your sin was paid in Christ's body on the tree. Further, you are free from encountering the call to righteousness as a burden because it is no longer you who lives, but Christ who lives in you, giving you all your righteousness, both his righteousness imputed to you and your actual lived righteousness. It's all given to you as a gift. So what is left for you to do? Live by faith. You died with Christ by faith. You have been raised with Christ by faith. Now live by faith. There is still a path in front of you, a life in the flesh, in this body, until Jesus comes or calls you home. And it is truly yours to live in freedom by faith. What will this look like? To live by faith is to live in a settled disposition of trust. It is the attitude that says, I know that God has loved me in Christ. I trust that he will give me strength for whatever he calls me to. I trust that he is with me and I am never alone. I trust that saying no to my flesh now in this temptation will bring me good that I cannot even imagine. I trust that his spirit is working in me, producing his fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. I trust that this sin will die because Christ will kill it, kill it because he has killed it. And I trust that I can accomplish anything he sets me out to do. It is a life of a bold and settled confidence that moves forward in obedience and love despite any opposition or any hardship. And in one sense, intuitively on a human level, we know what living by faith looks like. We know what in our earthly life faith is like. We know also what it is not. Whenever I get into an airplane, I check the turbulence forecast. If you've ever seen it, there's a webpage where you can do this. I study intently the squiggles on the map and I try to find out where and when in the route it is going to get bumpy. And inevitably, when turbulence comes, I start to get a bit shaky and I put in my headphones and I listen to some Psalms and I do this because I do not fly by faith. Despite knowing the principles of aerodynamics, and the statistics of just how rare it is for a commercial flight to be affected in a significant way by turbulence, I do not trust the flying tin can. I know that metal is heavy and it comes from the earth to which it longs to return. <laughs> and I cannot trust that it wants, really wants to stay in the sky. And Christian, you do not need to live your life checking the turbulence map. Your sin has been dealt with. Your righteousness, even your obedience is given to you. Your course is set by the Savior who died for you, who rose for you, and now who lives in you. You are free to live by faith. Yeah. And it is not merely a vague faith in general. It's not faith because you are such a trusting and positive person, but faith, as Paul says here, in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We can live this way because we are loved this way. How can you face today with faith? The Son of God loved you and gave himself for you. Why can you, by grace, defeat sin today? The Son of God loved you and gave himself for you. How can you face another grueling day of depression or persecution or temptation? By faith in the Son of God who loved you and gave himself for you. At this point, I want to make two observations and then we'll close. First, have you noticed how autobiographical this passage is? I died to the law that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. Christ lives in me. I live by faith. The Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. Why is this passage so relentlessly autobiographical? 
Paul is trying to convince the Galatians that they should live by faith and by the spirit, not by the law and by the flesh. So why so many eyes and me's? Why is it all first person? Well, this passage is so strongly autobiographical, so full of I to show us that the precious doctrines in it, justification, regeneration, union with Christ, that these are not fully understood. They're not fully believed in if they remain for us third person dogmatic statements. Rather, we only truly and fully believe these things and receive power from them when we can say them in the first person. It is not enough to know that Christ accomplished justification. You must be able to say that Jesus justifies me. He is my righteousness. It's not enough to know that Christ is united with his people. You must be able to say Christ lives in me. Christ takes the punishment of the law for his people. I have been crucified with Christ. Christ rose up to bring his people life. I have been raised with Christ. Christ lives in his people. I no longer live. Christ lives in me. Christ loves his own. Jesus loves me. He loved me. Gave himself for me. And each one in this room can say that. It is only when you can say these things in the first person. Only when you believe that they are true, not just in general, not just as principles, but for you, can you live in the strength that they provide. And this brings me to my last observation. We can only live in the type of faith and freedom that Galatians 2, 19 and 20 spurs us to when we know deep in our bones that Jesus does in fact love us, loves you, loves me. We, we do not believe in order to be loved. You believe because you are loved. And because our faith is so often weak, so slow to lay hold of God's goodness for us, Paul doesn't stop at just saying who loved us, but he continues, he says, our faith is in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He presents proof. He gives us an objective reminder for when our hearts doubt. Do you ever wonder whether he really loves you? Do you ever doubt that Jesus really does love you? Well, this passage says, doubt no further. He gave himself for you. The Son of God did not die for no purpose. And as surely as Jesus died on the cross, Jesus loves you. It is not left up to your subjective apprehension of his love. He has given you objective proof. He died. He gave himself. Therefore, he loves you. So whenever you are prone to doubt, or whenever this faith seems difficult, whenever it is hard to take the next step of obedience and faith that he calls you to, look to the cross. Hold up the cross before your eyes and see your Lord upon the tree. See the Son of God crucified for you. There he gave himself and there he shows you for all time that he loves you. He loved you through death and into resurrection life. And his love, his love for you makes possible your next step of faith. In Christ, we died. In Christ, we have been raised. And in Christ, we live. And so then, as we go from here, let us live by faith in the Son of God who loved me, who loved us and gave himself for me. Let's pray. Lord, we are unworthy of these things. Thank you that in Christ we are forgiven and made new. We thank you that you live in us. Help us to live the life you set out for us. May we keep in step with the Spirit. May you work mightily in us. And may Christ live the life he will live in us. In Jesus' name, amen.